Başkanı bekliyoruz. Ee, başkan da gelince hemen programa başlayacağız. Tamam, biz tamam. hazırız. Başkanımız giriyor şu an. Tamam. Ee, Merve Hanım, ben bir açılış yapacağım. Sonra tamam. e, size... Yani, yani moderatörün genelini size bırakacağım, bilginiz olsun. Aa, okey, tamam, peki. Yani ben, tamam, tamam. Yani ben. Tamam, no problem, okey. Mr. President, you're welcome. Hello, how are you? Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. Uh, hope everything is well, I think. Because uh, we are uh, in a pandemic, you know, you know. Everything is well, I think. Uh, no health problem for everybody. Sorry, I didn't hear you well because the doors were open. Okay, okay, and I have right. some noise in the other room. Okay, so. okay, okay. Are we, every, everything is going well, I think, because you know we are in pandemic. Uh, hope your health is well. Yes, I think the situation is better. Okay. Fortunately, in Turkey, and now I am speaking with you from Azaz in in Syria. Ah. The epidemic situation here is good, alhamdulillah. That's and great. You know, the Syrians are suffering, so they don't uh, need any more problems. <laughs> oh. uh, okay, uh, let's begin then. Uh, thanks uh, everyone uh, joining us for a very, very important event uh, hosted by Istanbul Aydın University. Uh, you know, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Zoom meetings became uh, a part of our lives. Uh, in this process, we have organized meetings with our professors and experts for, from difficult fields. Today, uh, it was the sixth of this series on the topic, ideas on the future of Syria. Uh, we again addressed a very important issue for Turkey and also our region. Uh, today, really, we welcome a very important guest, uh, Mr. Nasser Al-Hariri, uh, President of National Coalition of Syrian Revolution and Opposition Forces. Uh, Mr. Hariri, again, you welcome. Uh, it is an honor for us uh, together with you in a such event. Uh, we will talk with Mr. Hariri the, uh, the current situation in Syria and the future of the country. Uh, it will be uh, very important for all of us to receive really direct information from a leader uh, involved in the problems. Uh, today, I am also going to run this webinar with a very respectable, very esteemed journalist, Mr. Merve Şebne Moruç. Uh, on behalf of our university, uh, I really salute both of you. Uh, thank, thank you very much again. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, our uh, president, uh, Mr. Mustafa Aydın, uh, who uh, provided us with these opportunities also. And uh, I would like to thank uh, my uh, dear assistant, Bilgian. He has made great efforts in every organization, really. Yeah, be before we start to open up the panel, uh, you know, I would like to give you a brief reminder of the Syrian crisis first. Yeah? It is your turn, doctor. Yeah, everything was starting in March uh, 211 uh, with this gravity drawn uh, by high school students uh, affected by the moment in Arab countries in Dara. Uh, maybe not Bashir al-Assad, uh, who has been nicknamed the doctor, uh, but it brought uh, an uh, end to the powerful central system that has been going on for almost 50 years. Yeah, uh, on March uh, 15 uh, of uh, 2011, uh, protests uh, were held in Damascus and Daria by Friday prayers uh, after the students were detained and their families were abused, uh, really. Uh, President Assad responded harshly, uh, killing dozens of civilians. Uh, when protests spread uh, across the country, uh, the 10-year civil war began. Today, it is possible 
it is impossible, pardon, it is impossible to find a Syrian where he lives has not been bombed, who hasn't lost a relative and who hasn't been away from his family. Almost 600,000 people died in 10 years, uh, which the country's population of 22 million uh, at the beginning of the uh, crisis. More than, more than uh, 6.5 million Syrians have been uh, internally displaced, mostly in tents or in, in unsanitary conditions. More than 5.6 million people uh, have left Syria, as you know, uh, 3.6 million, up to 3.6 million, I think, of them live in uh, our country in Turkey. Uh, yeah, the regime and its supporters uh, control the uh, southern, uh, southern provinces of Dara, Kunetra, the capital Damascus, Lactia and Tartus on the eastern Mediterranean coast and homes in the central part of the country. Region forces also dominate the central provinces of Hama, uh, Halep in the north and uh, Deirizor in the east. The opposition has a presence in Idlib, Ofretas shit operation area, Afrin, uh, Tel Abiyad, and the Resulain districts. And also the uh, uh, PKK, you know, uh, uh, VPG, uh, a US backed terrorist group occupies the northern district of Mimbich and Tarifat and the areas of the uh, of Freitas. Yeah, the, the case files, uh, which regime forces have violated from time to time really, is really last main time nowadays. Between 2017 and uh, with 2020, about 2 million civilians were forced to migrate to areas close to the Turkish border uh, in attacks by Rus Russia and the regime forces. Uh, the, these uh, statements really are the reality in uh, Syria. Now, uh, let's begin the webinar uh, with, uh, with uh, my uh, respectable esteemed journalist, Merve Şebnem Oruç. Uh, the floor is uh, yours, uh, Ms. Oruç. Thank you, Professor Karaja, and thanks for your kind invitation and your very, very kind introduction. Thank you very much and welcome, Mr. Nasser Al Hariri. It's been, I think, almost a year since we had our last meeting. You uh, had a meeting with Turkish journalists and it was very fruitful and uh, we learned more about Syria and actually I think it was very fruitful for you as um, maybe you um, got some insights uh, from Turkish perspective at least the public's perspective with regards to Syria and that is why it's really nice to see you again first I want to um I uh, deliver my condolences uh, for Afrin. Yes, yesterday there was a shelling in Afrin and uh, the last number of the killed uh, people, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is 13. And uh, actually it's happening again and again before we start uh, the general uh, webinar, actually. I want to ask you about the situation in Afrin and mostly uh, Turkey protected uh, areas. Uh, are these attacks uh, carried out by the PKK and the Syrians living there in in this region, uh, how do they uh, look at this issue? And uh, with regards to your perspective, I would like to see, I would like to understand uh, what do you think about the future? Will they continue? Uh, thanks, thank you very much again. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you, Professor. Thank you, dear colleagues and the friends, the brothers from uh, all the provinces. Uh, in, in Turkey. 
It is also an honor for us to participate in this uh, seminar uh, to try to exchange our ideas about the latest developments in the political field and on the ground, especially as we see now that there is an international diplomatic movement and uh, summits happening in, in Ingiltra, in Brussels, and also tomorrow we have a summit between the American and the Russian uh, president, uh, presidents. Uh, thank you very much for your condolences. Uh, yes, as you know, two days ago, in, uh, on Saturday 12th uh, June, our crime took place uh, when Al Shifa Hospital in the town of Afrin was hit with rockets from the areas under the control of the murderous Assad regime and the terrorist PYD militia. The PCS attack killed and injured dozens of civilians. Uh, until this moment, we have 13 have been killed and about 25 has been heavily injured. Uh, we have from them women and children. Uh, in that regard, the international community must take a firm position towards the Assad regime and the terrorist UID militias, as uh, well as stop supporting them, as the support amounts to supporting terrorist organizations that kill uh, civilians. Uh, the terrorist PYD militia and all offshoots of the BKK terrorist organization in Syria have long exposed their organic relationship with the Assad regime. They are copying the crime, violations and war crimes that the Assad regime is committing with the support of Russia and Iran. Uh, the terrorist attack in Afrin involved the use of rockets and artillery that hit the emergency department of Ashifa Hospital. We in the Syrian opposition coalition call on the international parties supporting this terrorist organization to reconsider their position. They have to denounce all kinds of support for these organizations in Syria under the pretext of supporting democracy, especially those that bomb hospitals and kill doctors and patients. Now about your uh, questions, which is a good question, you know, that we have now uh, liberated areas in Syria, about 11% of the Syrian territory. And we have in it about 4.7 uh, civilian, uh, million civilian Syrians living there. And uh, this area is covered by a uh, de-escalation agreement between Russia and Turkey, which had been assigned uh, on March uh, 2020. And to speak frankly, this area is living calmly, but we see from time to time violation from the Assad regime and the Iranian militias and from the Russian air uh, forces targeted civilians here and there in the villages and towns of this area. Simultaneously, at the same time, we see bombing uh, done by the uh, sleeping cells of PKK or Daesh, ISIS, or the Assad regime. Uh, we saw a lot of them in Afrin, in Jenderis, Al Bab, Al Ra'i, uh, uh, and other, other places. So now Syrians, every day, every moment, are questioning what is the future of the de escalation agreement and what is the future of this area? Is there an opportunity to go back to this area and begin our lives normally again? Or should we look? for a window to be uh, uh, as a refugee in the ne uh, neighboring countries or far in another uh, states. Uh, and to answer this, qu this question, uh, we have to convey the internal discussions between Syrians. The majority of us see that this agreement will be protected uh, by Turkey. And all of us remember the uh, common military operation which has uh, been implemented uh, in 2020 against the Assad regime, 
and after this military operation, the Assad regime have been prevented from being يعني, advanced in this area. So we hope and we see through our common military and political work with Turkey, uh, we'll be able to protect this area and prevent any progress, any advancement done by the Assad regime and its backers to this area. Uh, after or يعني, more than that, we are connecting with our friends in Europe, the United States, even some Arab countries to support the old idea of establishing a genuine safe zone in this area and inhibiting the Assad regime of uh, uh, doing any military operations or violations in this area, which is very important. In the civilian uh, regard, this area has developed a lot. So now we see hospital, the primary care units, we see institutions uh, are you know, doing, are trying to provide stability and govanlik in this area and prov provide uh, food and the drug and other essential basics for the Syrian people. But you know, uh, this work is done by a common effort uh, between Turkey and the Syrian opposition. In this regard, we need the help of the international community, of the United Nations, of uh, the Arab countries or Gulf countries, because the building of this area is not a small, it's very heavy. Uh, yani we are speaking about a state. It's, uh, it's about 5 million and uh, uh, 17,000 uh, uh, kilometers square. So this needs a lot of help and support from the international community. And this is exactly what we are doing, what we are trying <laughs> to do through our connection with the states of the world. Thank you, thank you very much for your um, answer. Uh, Mr. Karaja, Professor Karaja, uh, do you have anything else to add or any other questions to just, Mr. Just, Hariri? Just. Because I want to um, uh, see if and understand the perspective from Turkish side as well. Yeah, that's, that's great. Maybe uh, we also uh, asked the president uh, the processes, uh, Mr. Oruç, the, the Geneva and also the Astana processes. It is so important because, you know, Turkey is uh, in both uh, processes, especially Astana is uh, more uh, powerful than the Geneva, I think. So uh, it is very important. So, uh, Mr. President, do you have any contact with Bashir al-Assad because uh, of the uh, connecting the Geneva processes? Do you? No, we didn't uh, have any uh, uh, direct connection with Bashar al-Assad and its regime. But you know, the Syrian opposition, yes, I, I, I know your, your, uh, your demand. Uh, but the Syrian opposition, sorry, there is no voice. Uh, Professor Karaja, uh, your, your mic is off. Pardon, pardon, yeah. pardon, pardon, pardon. Uh, you said that you uh, hasn't had uh, any uh, connection with, with Bashar al-Assad because of you or because of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, do you want to con contact or not? It is so important then. Yes, uh, yani personally or as organizations, we don't have any direct connection with Bashar al-Assad. But uh, on the other hand, we have tried a lot during 11 years to have direct negotiations with the Syrian regime under the umbrella of the United Nations uh, in Geneva to implement Geneva Communique and the other Security Council resolution, especially 2254 and the other uh, 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 Security Council resolution. But unfortunately, and we as Syrians, we know this regime will. This regime is not believing in the political solution. He will not participate genuinely, sincerely in the political negotiation to, to have a political solution in, inside Syria. So you remember that Geneva process had begun from about seven years until this moment, there is no progress in this process. And we have another parallel 
platforms for negotiation, as you mentioned in Astana. And now, nowadays, uh, Russia is inviting for the uh, uh, 16th round of negotiation in Astana, but uh, also there is no significant result. Yes, I know that this area, Idlib and its surroundings, is protected by uh, an agreement between Russia and Turkey, which is good and appreciated by the Syrian people. But this was uh, 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 as a result of the uh, common relationship between Turkey and Russia, not from Astana itself. So we know that the opposition and Turkey had tried a lot in Astana and Geneva to have a positive results reflecting directly on the lives of the Syrian people inside and outside Syria. But at the same time, we saw the Assad regime delegation, the Russian delegation, and especially the Iranian dele delegation are trying every time to block any initiative or any steps to have results in these negotiations. For that reason, we have seen uh, a, a pause in, in Astana even meetings. Yani the last meeting happened maybe two months after one year pause of these negotiations in Astana. The reason of the obstruction in Geneva is the same reason of obstruction in Astana, which is the Assad regime and its backers. They don't believe in the political process. They still account on the military operations, taking terrorism as a pretext to continue their military operations on, on everywhere. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Ms. Warch, maybe I ask uh, one more question, uh, including these questions. Okay, uh, to follow up, yeah. Yeah, you know, President, uh, the, the recent ele elections, I, I am laughing, you see, because uh, I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on the legitimacy of the recent elections in Syria? Yeah, you know, Bashar Assad won uh, approximately 96% uh, votes. Yes, it was like the worst joke yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because I, I'm laughing, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we stress our rejection of the election farce that the Assad regime conducted in violation of the UN uh, resolutions, because we consider the only uh, legitimate uh, election now is the legitimate and is the election under the auspices of the United Nations uh, by implementation of 2254, which says that the humanitarian steps should be taken directly, especially the detainees issue, then establishing the transitional governing body and having a new constitution, then uh, an election under the auspices of the United Nations, uh, uh, including all uh, Syria. The fraudul uh, fraudulent elections that the Assad regime held uh, in its areas recently were met with widespread rejection, not only from Syrians, from us in the <coughs> National Coalition of Syrian Revolution and Opposition Forces, and many states as well as uh, from the Syrian people. And you remember the German and the Turkish uh, decisions, which were uh, greatly welcomed from the Syrian people when they prevented the Al-Assad consulates to do these elections in Germany and in Turkey. The positions of the states that confirmed their rejection of this farce deserve thanks and appreciation as they have given Syrians hope for serious steps to support their struggle for freedom, democracy, and justice, and reaching a political solution to ensure the transfer of power to a transitional governing uh, body. Also, sensible media and social media outlets have significantly con contributed and are still exposing this total farce, and they des deserve thanks and appreciation. I think that. The, the election, which was supported by, by the way, by, by Russia, it was a, a part of a, 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 a big uh, process, which aimed, which aims to the rehabilitation of the Syrian regime. So you remember 
Russia tried a lot to reconciliate the Assad regime uh, uh, relations with the Arab countries and to return the Syrian regime to the Arab League. And also they have tried a lot to convince us, the opposition, or to convince other states in the world to begin uh, the construction process inside Syria before the political uh, transition. All of us remember Russia when they invited for a conference for refugees. In this conference, about 27 states uh, have uh, participated in this conference, but none of them uh, is uh, hosting any refugee in its land. So there was يعني, a lot, or there were a lot of, of, uh, uh, of states boycotting this conference and they still considered that any return for refugees to Syria should be vulnerable and dignified and safe. And this is not the situation uh, on the ground. So we think that يعني, the Assad regime and Russia has got nothing from this election because all of us uh, know that this is illegal, illegitimate uh, election and we have to do our best to have uh, 2244 uh, uh, 44, uh, implemented and to have this election under the auspices of the United uh, States. And we, we can see clearly that more than half of the Syrian people are not able and they didn't participate in this election. So how, how could we say that this is a legitimate election? I see. Thank you, Mr. President. Actually, before we continue, I would like to ask you a personal question because, yes, we are now talking about the uh, present time, present, what's happening today. But um, especially after the Daesh rose from its ashes in Iraq and uh, to control in time in Syria, especially in the northern border, people start not to talk about the brutality of Assad. It was like the uh, best of the two worst. That was kind of, you know, um, choosing the um, um, kind of the in, in their perspective choosing the uh, making research for my books and articles on the ground in Syria I talked to many former security officers and um, they say that I'm just asking this to make people understand how the election process uh, was working, they, it was working previously, before this uh, period. So uh, some security forces told me that, uh, especially for them, they had to use their votes in a, um, paper, uh, on a paper, but it has to be, you know, seen. And some has to, you know, you, you, they are uh, what's with blood to show their loyalty to Assad. Was so it democratic. like this? So democratic, Ms. So yes, democratic. so democratic. Was it true? Because I asked many people and I want to, again, confirm. Or other than that, for civilians, how was the procedure going? So uh, now, yes, it's a farcical situation. It's like a joke, but um, to remember the past. To, to make the people understand why the Syrian people uh, oppose Assad regime. What was uh, the elections? How was it proceeding before the civil war? Yes. Yani, uh, you, uh, you, you remember that even the election inside Syria has conveyed to a kind of referendum. So nobody can or, or is able to be a candidate for presidency. There is no uh, uh, official organization responsible for the election inside Syria. All the process is held, administrated, and supervised and implemented by Mukhabarat, by the security branches of the Assad regime. I remember was when I was a doctor in the hospital, by the way, I am a cardiologist. My cousin was a member in the Syrian parliament. And yani, he is now depicted 
from this the, the parliament and he is living in Jordan. I mm. remember when I was a doctor in the hospital when we be enforced to go the, to the voting uh, center. By the way, the list of, of uh, voters were ready before and the papers were filled before, but we have uh, been forced to go to the voting center just to take a, pic uh, a picture or make an interview in the TV that the Syrian people are participating in a democratic and the free uh, uh, voting. And as you mentioned, the majority of us were uh, also enforced to sign by blood on the paper uh, saying that you are half of al-Assad in the past and Bashar al-Assad now, you are the only people, the only person who are able, who is able to lead our country to the future, to like wow. our areas from the from Israel, and you know this uh, uh, slogan, resistance. So the Syrian people were forced to be silent, uh, not say any word regarding democracy or regarding freedom or regarding their uh, essential services, uh, services or essential uh, needs because the country is busy with the battle against Israel and all of us know well that half of the Assad in the past had assigned a sacred agreement with Israel giving them Al Golan Heights and protected and protecting uh, the border between Syria and and uh, uh, and Israel and even in this election a lot of videos have been circulating say and yani seeing the the real the reality of the election inside Syria and Syrians also know well that they haven't been given an opportunity to vote uh, uh, freely or from about 50 or 60 years so there is no election inside Syria and if Syrians know that their voting will be valuable the majority of them will vote but the result is clear. And imagine that Bashar al-Assad has said that uh, I think about 14 million has been has participated in the election. While the UN numbers of IDBs and refugees of Syria saying said that about 14 million of Syria now are outside their homes. Uh, either IDBs in the northwest of Syria, we have about five million of Syrians in, 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 in the Northwest, and uh, or uh, refugees in Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, and other places. So it is, uh, yani, it is a game, we know it, uh, and we think. And if Bashar al-Assad is confident that he will, will, he will win in the election, why does he refuse the implementation of 2254, which says that an election, a free election, and that the auspices of the United Nations should be held inside Syria. He refused this. the UN Security Council resolution. He refuses to have this free election inside Syria because he knows well that the moment he allow this kind of election to happen inside Syria, he will lose everything. Yeah, I see. Mr. Uh, Professor Kurija, if you let me ask another follow-up question with regards, of course, to, of course, uh, of with regards to Geneva uh, process. Actually, this is very important. Uh, what uh, President uh, Hariri said, um, he said, not only Assad regime, but also Iran and Russia is blocking the process. Actually, yeah, we know about Iran. It's um, um, Tehran is not so willing to uh, reach a political solution, and that they are on the table. Actually, not only from in my opinion, but many people think that they are there just because Russia says sit here, but. 
Uh, what about Russians? Are they really blocking? Because when we talk some authorities in Moscow and Ankara, they say that uh, Russia is looking for a political solution. But now you said that Russians are also blocking uh, the process as well. Why? Why are they doing that? Yani, uh, if we review now the behavior of, the, of Russia, we can understand, understand quickly their intentions inside Syria. Uh, first, we think that what happened in Syria was a real opportunity for Russia to correct the balance between it and the United States. Now, they have controlled many areas in many states in the area, not only Uh, uh, not only Syria. For that reason, we think that Russia now is fighting not only for Bashar al-Assad, they support Bashar al-Assad, but not only for Bashar al-Assad, but, but for their own interests inside Syria. And uh, we know from our information and from our friends that uh, many states have tried to open negotiation with Russia regarding Syria, for Syria. But every time, Russia was asking uh, for issues outside the Syrian fight. They have their own demands from the international community to put Syria on the table for negotiation. But we see, uh, or we know, that Russia knows very well how to push for a political solution in Syria not only by saying words that we are uh, supporting stability or supporting political solution, etc. Uh, Russia can push for the political solution by stopping the bombing and violations it is carrying out on the borders of the regime's control area, and by stopping the use, uh, to use the Russian veto in the Security Council, and by implementing the 2254. I think uh, uh, from my practice in the, I was the head of the uh, uh, Syria negotiation uh, delegation, and also I was the head of the Syria negotiation commission for about uh, more than three years. I think that Russia has its own concepts for the political solution. They don't agree on Geneva communique or 2054 as The, uh, the, the real base for negotiation and for reaching a political solution. And you remember that Russia has encouraged or had encouraged and supported the holding of so-called National Conference for Dialogue in Suchi yeah. Yeah. Years, yeah. three years ago. When they ha have invited more than 1,300 of the uh, Syrian regime's uh, loyals, to this conference and invited some يعني, opponent persons from outside Syria to send a signal to the international states that we are holding a conference for dialogue inside Syria. But their attempts have uh, completely failed because the majority of the Syrian people knows well the core position of, of Russia regarding the Syrian fight. Not only Syrians. Now, if you ask Turkey or the Arab countries, the European countries, America, all of them are saying that we are on the table besides the opposition, waiting the president of the Kremlin to come to the table and say we are ready to compromise. Because even or although that we have done a lot of attempts to try to convince Russia to account on the Syrian people, not on this dictator regime, and to begin negotiate about the implementation of 2254. And we are ready to discuss the interests of the Russian inside Syria and in the region, but uh, depending on our national interests. But unfortunately, all of these attempts have been failed because Russia is insisting to support the Assad regime They are speaking a lot, yes, about the political solution, but they are uh, 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 counting more on the military operation 
and you can see now what's happening on Idlib or Latakia suburb or other liberated areas. Uh, maybe, uh, Ms. Oruç, uh, I add something uh, about, sure, sure. about Russian behaviors, uh, about Syrian crisis, why uh, it changes probably. Uh, you know that uh, since 2014, uh, from the uh, Krim uh, crisis, uh, Russia really uh, feels uh, herself very, very alone. Uh, so China is not enough for Russia. So uh, the, especially the near future, you know, the political behaviors of Arab countries uh, against the uh, Assad regime uh, changed. You know, they they, they are uh, now pro Assad or something. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but <laughs> at it, least it, some it, of them. It, yeah, it is it is changed. Why? Because probably. Uh, U.S., probably U.S., you know, because we are talking about the Saudi Arabia and, uh, you know, the, the other Arab countries. We are so connected with the uh, U.S. government. So U.S. probably forced them to connect with Assad. Maybe in the future, Biden government try to connect with the Assad. Don't forget that. <laughs> Don't mm. forget that. And also, you know, the negotiation between Iran and U.S. on nuclear agreement you know, is so important, you know. And also the change of government in Israel is so important. And NATO's pressure on Russia uh, after the Ukraine crisis is, is so important. So Russia uh, probably want to hold Assad uh, in her hands especially. And because of that, uh, Russian's policy uh, now in Syria may be named, it is, it is uh, belong to me, uh, right. stability of instability. It is yeah. in, instable Syria is really legitimate Russian's position in the uh, Middle East. It is so important. Okay, then I want to ask a question and I think both of you can uh, answer because this is very crucial. As Professor Karaja um, quoted uh, about the Iran nuclear negotiation during the second term of Obama administration. Yes, probably they allegedly, uh, they said that th this was about the, the, the peace for the region, but they did not put a condition or at least a verbal warning uh, to Tehran to stop uh, escalating violence in Syria. Uh, one thing. And as uh, we know, mm, not, um, many people around the world see Biden administration as the third of the Obama period. Uh, there can be another nuclear deal. First, another thing I want, and um, uh, we know that uh, the, the, in Washington during Trump era, always people said that Trump has relations with Russia. But I remember that. This Iran nuclear deal was announced right after chemical deal uh, between Russia and the United States after this uh, horrific chemical attack in uh, Ghouta, Eastern Ghouta. So it was a very dirty bargain. And let me ask you one question. Yes, Tur Turkey had to change its, po its politics because its NATO allies uh, left uh, Turkey, abandoned uh, Turkey. That is why we had to find another path with Russia. But now the geopolitics is back. Obama's geopolitics is back. What do you think? What if Russia and the United States uh, make an, another agreement uh, for uh, Syria again, as Biden and Putin will uh, meet uh, tomorrow, I guess, and 
after they say that they say each other killer, murderer, and etc. So, what do you think about that? And other than that, this is very crucial. Would both countries, would both um, superpowers, uh, try to put Turkey again in a tight corner? Because, as you said, I believe that Putin himself has an end game plan that he has his own end game plan. And maybe one day he will replace Assad because he is not only the protector of Assad, but also the owner of Assad. So what do you think about a possible um, negotiation or uh, a deal between Russia and the United States in the next coming uh, months or years? Is the question for me? Yes, yes, please. And of course, yes. uh, you, Professor you, Tarek, you, you, you are the guest, <laughs> Mr. President. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, now, you know that the Syrian file is a Syrian file first, regional file, and international file. Yeah. So without having this consensus, on the three levels, the political solution will be impossible inside Syria. Uh, unfortunately, Syrians are paying the heavy price of, from this conflict because we see now the excesses in the region. We see how the friends of Syria who have been sitting on the same table, table to support the Syrian cause now, each state is fighting the other the other states. At the same time, I think you have heard the current or recurrent uh, uh, briefing of uh, the UN Special Envoy, Mr. Gil Peterson, in the Security Council, when, ha when he nearly announced the failure of the political process and the Constitutional Committee. He didn't say that uh, frankly, but you can uh, feel uh, from his uh, briefing that the situation is very difficult. Now the, the Constitutional Committee is about two years from its beginning on, on, on 2019 without getting any progress. In this briefing of Mr. Gear Peterson, he said uh, frankly that the UN needs the international support. The United Nations need an active diplomatic, international diplomatic platform to push forward the political process inside Syria. And without that, Mr. Peterson doesn't have magic powers to have this solution. After that, also, he suggested parcha parcha approach, peace peace approach, to have to try to implement the 2254 step by step. But he said, who will be the first, the first provider of this uh, step? So, and also the international community in general, the Arab states, Syrians, Turkey, European countries, where, uh, uh, how can I say that, were afraid that this situation in Syria will be freezed will be stopped without any crucial movement because all of us have lost the American leadership in our axis. The yes. regime acts contain Russia, uh, most, Russia, uh, China, Iran, and Al-Assad regime, and they are very active. They are active on the ground. They are active in the Security Council and in, in everything. But our axis have been paralyzed because we have lost the American leadership for a long time. And I think in this regard, we have to, to appreciate the Turkish role because in this issue, Turkey has taken the flag of leadership because Turkey was faced with threatens on the Syrian people and on the Turkish security uh, uh, issue. So, Turkey has taken this flag and they have decided to intervene uh, individually in Syria 
to fight against terrorism, against Al-Assad regime, because the American role, the American leadership was lost completely. So now the world in general is optimistic. When we see that there is a summit in London, in, in Inglaterra, G7, we have a summit in Brussels, uh, NATO, a summit in uh, Geneva, and we have bilateral summits with what happened yesterday between the President Erdogan and the President uh, Biden. So yeah. in Syrians, in addition to the states, are waiting an understanding or agreement. And the Russian-American agreement is essential in this issue. But in this regard, we have two possibilities. First, to have an agreement to implement 2254. 2254 uh, protects the rights of the Syrian people. The reg regional states are agreeing on this uh, uh, decision, so it is acceptable for all of us. But I think that Russia, that the Syrian regime and Iran will continue to refuse this uh, 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 resolution because they don't want to reach a political solution. The other scenario is to have a bad deal or a bad agreement between Russia and, uh, and uh, America. But in this regard, I think it is impossible to implement any agreement even between Russia and, Turkey, uh, Russia and America without the acceptance of Turkey, Saudi Arabia in the second yani, uh, step, and the Syrian people actors. So the most, proper, uh, the most uh, yani, uh, acceptable uh, option is to have an American-Russian deal to implement 2254. Does anybody guarantee that? No, nobody can guarantee that. But we are following up with our partners, with our colleagues, with our friends in Ankara and in other states to first to try to put the Syrian file on the agenda of these meetings. Second, to, to have this file in all its details, not only the humanitarian issue, which is very important, but in addition to that, we have to activate the humanitarian issue in the Syrian file, but also to have this international dynamics to push forward the political solution because now we are after 11 years from the beginning of the revolution. Thank you, Professor Kurja. Anything to add or any other questions to President? It's, it's, it's a very well question, uh, Mr. Orch, really very well question. Maybe uh, it, it's a, also a project uh, uh, to the future of the country, maybe. Uh, but maybe I, I ask uh, the, the, some a question that uh, who has uh, the control over Syrian national resources and water resources springs? Mm -hmm. It's so yeah. important. It is so important. Why? Because. Uh, it is important for us also because they earn money and they earn money and uh, uh, get uh, the guns. Yeah, you know that. It is so important for the Turkish security also. So uh, who, who do it, uh, Mr. President? Natural sources, you mean oil? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And also, also it's very important for the uh, Middle East, you know, Mr. Oruç, the water. Water yes, is, yes, yes, yes. The, the other water. biggest issue ah, and the, yeah. the, the long time uh, crisis water. between Turkey and Syria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. President, yeah. Bulgaria, <laughs> on the region. So when we are speaking about the regime held areas, now all the resources are in the hand of Russia and Iran in a balanced shape. Sometimes we, we see that Iran is more engaged in this issue. <laughs> we see that Russia is trying to defend its concerns and interests and try to uh, to return this balance back again. When we say when we speak about uh, northeast of Syria, America is controlling yani, everything, uh, uh, oil, gas, and unfortunately they allow uh, PKK, BAD, BG to invest these uh, uh, normal 
resources and benefits from its prices to activate their uh, project in the area. They have, have announced the self-administration and they are trying to separate a uh, parcha or a piece of Syria for their uh, own state, as they, they say. Now, for water, we have uh, an agreement between Syria and Jordan in the south of Syria. And also we have agreements between Syria, Iraq, and uh, Turkey in the north northeast of Syria. And we have uh, a problem. We see, we see it from time to time, uh, which is the water in Al Hasaka province uh, when PYD cut electricity to uh, the, the station, which is يعني, responsible to provide water to some areas in, in, in northeast of Syria. So the, the inhabitants in this area uh, will, will be not able to have uh, this station works and to provide water. So it was there was a lot of negotiation about this issue mediated by Turkey and the United States to force these militias not to cut the electricity and to allow this water station to be continuous in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, product, in, in sending water to the, uh, in, uh, uh, to the uh, يعني, populated areas to, to, to be sure that the, the water will not be cut in this area. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. May I ask on sure, one sure. more question? It is so important that you mentioned the, the relations uh, between Russia and Iran on national uh, uh, resources. resources in Syria. Maybe uh, it is it is a really timely question. Uh, can Iran's relationship with Russia uh, continue at this level in Syria, or the Russian uh, relations with uh, Iran really continue at this level in Syria in the near future? I think. Uh, are true. there any con contradictions of interest? Yeah, maybe, yeah you yeah. know that the, the nuclear deal with U.S. Iran uh, and. Uh, that I mentioned before, the change of government in Israel, maybe the connection with the Saudi Arabian uh, government, with Iran government, is so important for the uh, Syrian future, I think, yes. Mr. Oric. Yeah. So this question may be uh, connected with uh, these statements. I think that the relationship between Russia and Iran is very strong, and it is strategic, because we are speaking about uh, يعني, some kind of coalition, uh, East coalition and uh, West coalition. I mean by East coalition, China, Russia, and Iran, uh, in addition to some countries in the region. Even now, even some Arab countries began uh, to go to the direction of Iran, Russia, and China because of the behavior of the United States in, in, in the area, even uh, Turkey. If we can now analyze the position, positions of Turkey, we can see how Turkey has shifted uh, uh, acutely uh, to the direction of Russia after uh, their relationship with, uh, with America has been damaged after many developments in the area, uh, especially the, the coup. So I think that there is a strategic relationship between uh, Russia and Iran, not only in Syria, but mm. in many other states, especially Iraq. You can see now that so-called Al-Hajj al-Shaabi or the Iranian militias are pushing the United, the American forces to depart from, uh, from Iraq, while the uh, Iraqi government has participated in a common security room contains four states, Russia, Iran, Syria, and Russia, Iran, maybe China. There is, uh, from about four or five years, there is a big cell contains all of these states to coordinate their efforts in the security issues يعني, together. So the relationship is strategic. Yes, there is some competition between Russia and Iran in Syria, 
but in the tactic levels, not in the strategic levels. So, and it is an opportunity for, for Russia now. It is an opportunity to have this relationship with China, with Iran, maybe in some uh, fields with uh, uh, Turkey, with some Arab countries. Even you can see now the relationship between Russia and Egypt, which have been cut for decades. Now it has been come back to, re to be reactivated, uh, reactivated again. So there is a competition, yes. But does this competition uh, can be increased to reach to a conflict between them? I don't think uh, so. And their coalition is getting stronger and stronger. Oh, I see. Uh, Professor Karaja, uh, since I made lots of visits to, visits to uh, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and many conflict zones, uh, uh, before I... Because of that, might... we are together with you in this <laughs> webinar, you know that. Yeah, <laughs> that is why I want to add something. As yes, a moderator, of I should not interrupt, but I want to... Now uh, I am the moderator, you are the guest. Don't worry about okay. that. Okay, <laughs> let's change the roles for a minute. And I want to share something. As president, uh, I made some uh, statements about Iraq. Uh, I was in Iraq, uh, especially in the region of Kirkuk, Erbil, Mosul, Mahmur area, at the eve of Mosul operation, which was very important for Brett McGurk and the uh, anti-ISIS coalition, as you remember. What I saw there was very, very interesting. You mentioned about Russia and Iran uh, relation and uh, coalition in Iraq, but also I saw uh, especially um, the late Talabani controlled areas in the late Talabani controlled areas. Unfortunately, the YPG, I expected the YPG, only YPG, I have to say, but uh, the armored vehicles and the other logistics uh, were uh, handled by the uh, Taliban Peshmerga. Well, it was very interesting, and uh, the armored vehicles, the tanks, and other stuff was American product, and they had to, you know, uh, be carried to uh, Mosul, and they were escorted by Hashti Shabi and Taliban Peshmerga, which was very interesting for me. Actually, when we come together, once when I want to share. Um, a very scary moment for me because I found myself in Hashti Shabi headquarters in Kirkuk, you know? Uh, but this is another uh, issue. Anyway, let me ask you a question uh, from here. Yes, now there is no human rights, uh, which is not related to anything such as geopolitics, geostrategy, geoeconomy, or even theology, theo, uh, economy or theopolitics. Uh, so uh, since uh, Israel has now a new prime minister and there is a so-called conflict between Iran and Israel, uh, what do you think about Israel's new situation in Syria? Okay, they have a secret understanding between Russia and Israel because they can, at least Israelis can uh, bombard any Iran locations and Rus Russia uh, gives a green light, gives a green light all the time. But other than that, uh, the new government of Israel is, uh, will be, I think, more Zionist and more religious and more uh, racist, unfortunately, when you look at the profile of Naftali Bennett and uh, his party. So uh, I want to be clear, uh, the opposition, Syrian opposition, uh, did they get, and have you get, or uh, some groups on the ground, got any support from Israel before, until now? 
and what will happen after today uh, concerning Israel's stance towards Syrian opposition and Assad as well. I think that Israel has a very important role in the Syrian uh, issue from the beginning of the revolution. And we have to remember, as you have mentioned, that we have a secret agreement between Al-Assad regime and Israel to, to at least protect its border. And uh, for decades, these borders have been completely uh, protected. So, as Syrians, we were asking from the beginning of the revolution, what is the Israeli position regarding what's happening, not only in Syria, but in the Arab in the Arab area, but especially in Syria, because we Syrian and we want our issue to, to, uh, to finish. Uh, we knew that Israel is preparing Bashar al-Assad to, to, to be kept in power. Why? Because, as we mentioned, he protected the border, so there is no need to change the situation to uh, a new leadership, which is unknown from Israeli, and they can't predict the behavior of the leader, new leadership of Syria. Second, we think that Bashar al-Assad had provided them with a golden opportunity to destroy the institutions of the state and to destroy the military organization, the military institution inside Syria. So it is better for Israel to have Syria as a failed state rather than a stable and democratic state. And we know, I think you know also, that the, after this terrible chemical attack on Eastern Ghouta, uh, at that time, the international community was preparing itself to react against the Assad regime. Then Russia came with the uh, uh, nuclear ag agreements between the Assad government and the international community. We knew that this deal was mediated by Netanyahu himself, by Israel, because Israel didn't want uh, Bashar al-Assad to be injured or hit at that time after a very a huge leaked information referred that uh, or indicated that uh, the state of Bashar al-Assad will fall directly after the first bomb uh, uh, on it at that time. So Israel also again protected Bashar al-Assad from being whole. About the assistance, I can assure you that there is no military assistance, assistance provided to the armed groups, to the free Syrian army from the Israeli side. But also to speak frankly, I have seen myself through one of my visits to the south of Syria, I have sit with uh, uh, my colleague's doctor who was responsible uh, uh, for treating the wounded people. He said that after closing the border and we have inside Syria, a lot of heavy wounded people, for example, somebody damaged in his brain or in his heart, etc., his vessels, uh, a lot of them, thousands of them have been sent uh, uh, to Israel, and they have been treated there and returned back to the to the area. Uh, this is an issue, but about the military support or the military cooperation, I can see, say the contrary. There is connection between the Assad regime and Israel at that area, and we can remember in this point the agreement which was assigned between the three states, the three sides, uh, Russia, America, and Israel, when they have given the, the liberated area in the south to the hands of the Syrian regime by some conditions or three conditions. First, to go to the agreements, go back to the agreements between Assad regime and Israel, then 
to guarantee the withdrawal of the Iranian forces and militias to about uh, uh, 60 kilometers uh, to the depth of, the, of Syria, far away from this border. So by conclusion, and we have other details, in conclusion, we think that the Israeli support was to the Assad regime and its backers, not for the uh, uh, Syrian opposition. And now, if we, if we can uh, uh, yani, uh, check the, the, the picture now in Syria, as you mentioned, we see recurrent Israeli attack on some Iranian sites, military sites, without any intervention from Russia. Russia keeping itself uh, uh, only observes what's going on. That means that there is an agreement between Israel and Russia as a guarantor of the Syrian regime to target Iran inside Syria, but without uh, uh, having any problem with the Assad regime itself. And now if you ask the Syrian, the majority of them say clearly that Israel is the main responsible of keeping Bashar al-Assad in power until this moment. Let me clarify. I want to ask a question. Uh, if Israel really wants uh, by itself or with the help of the United States, uh, it can or could have bombarded or attacked all the Iranian sites, military posts in Syria at all. But they didn't do that. They just did it uh, to specific locations, especially in the south, which is close to Israel border. What do you think about that? That is why I want to clarify it for our audience, uh, which looks like Israel says that we, uh, Iran is the biggest threat in the region. Iran is the enemy. So why do they let uh, Iran uh, present in Syria, yeah. other than the southeastern part, southwestern part, sorry, which is uh, bordering Israel and I mean, the Golan Heights, yeah. yeah yes, yeah, we know well that uh, when Hezbollah has interfered in Syria, Iran, in the beginning of the, of the revolution, not only Israel, the majority of states were uh, silent about this role because they wanted Iran and Hezbollah to help Bashar al-Assad and preventing him from being fall. It is very, very clear. But we think that yani, the lines, or how could we say, that the relation between Israel and Iran has damaged also within these years because Iran has passed or climbed over the red lines which Israel uh, doesn't want to be to be harmed in this regard. For that reason, I mean by that the weapons in the hand of Hezbollah in, in, in Lebanon, not only in, in Syria. So for that reason, I think that Iran began to disturb the Israeli position in the last three or four years. Uh, for that reason, for that 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 uh, sebab for uh, uh, Israel insisted on Russia to guarantee the withdrawal uh, of Iran to 80 kilometers, only 80 kilometers, not to depart from Syria. There is no problem between Israel and Iran regarding this issue. Israel allow uh, Iran to continue in its presence in Syria and help Bashar al-Assad from falling. But the red lines for Israel is uh, Hezbollah, providing Hezbollah with some yeah. specific uh, weapons in, uh, uh, in uh, Beirut, or to have this continuous connection between Tehran, Damascus, and the south of Lebanon. But regarding Bashar al-Assad, there is agreement between, there is an agreement between Russia and Israel to uh, do everything possible to prevent Bashar al-Assad from being full. Yeah, unfortunately, you're talking about the Syrian episode of the treacherous alliance in the region. Uh, Professor yeah. Kerja, let's continue with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I ask uh, because we have 15 minutes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, 
Mr. President, uh, when I look at the crisis in uh, Muslim world, I'm really worried. Why? Because Iraq hasn't stabilized in uh, 30 years, you know. In Afghanistan, however, almost nothing has been achieved in 20 years. Every international military intervention has failed uh, at uh, these countries. Uh, and those who intervened left behind insolvency. So uh, it, it is very, very clear question, Yaneda. Is there any possibility of reconciliation in the uh, medium term in Syria for you, President? Is it possible? Yani we have uh, reconciliation in our term of the political solution because in the end, Syria need reconciliation. But how and when? Yeah, it is, it is the main question, yeah. how and when. Exactly. Yeah. Many Syrians yani, try to think that they can normalize their relation with the Syrian regime. So many of them, for example, return back from Jordan, from Lebanon, from some Gulf countries. Uh, they have come back to Syria. And what is the future? They are calling us on a daily basis, calling for getting help because they want to go back, uh, to go outside Syria again. Some of them has been detained, tortured, tortured, and killed in the prisons of Bashar al-Assad. Far away from that, now the economic situation, the social situation, the security situation. There is no safe and calm environment inside Syria. Professor, believe me when I say that the majority of Syrians are willing and hoping to go back to Syria. I have uh, five of my brothers are refugees. Uh, two of them are in Vienna, Abstoria, and the three of them in Holanda. Uh, Netherlands. Uh, and they are waiting moment by moment to hear any a new happy news about the Syrian situation to go back for Syria because all of us were living in a, yani a good situation economically, etc. But our problem was and is still with Al Assad, uh, uh, Al -Assad regime. So, in our point, in our vision, the place of the reconciliation is after reaching a reasonable political agreement. And this reasonable political agreement is based mainly on Geneva Communique and 2254. And if you can think in the three main elements of, of this resolution, all of them are logical. Look, transitional governing body, from the regime and the opposition. Those who haven't been, uh, who haven't participated in the crimes against the Syrian people. Then a new constitution, then election. Nobody can say that we will give the power to Dr. Nasr al-Hariri or to the opposition. No, election under the auspices of the United States, I, uh, of the United Nations, sorry. So it is the minimum which can the Syrian people uh, accept? Because nobody can guarantee his life if he will go back to Syria under the control of this regime, because we know this regime for more than five decades. So political agreement, then national reconciliation to try to begin a new life inside Syria. But in the current situation, even those states who opened their relations with the Syrian regime from the Arab era, for example, they didn't feel well now. They didn't get anything because the Assad regime always is trying to invest this opening of ties in his favor, to his favor, not to bring stability or provide security to the area or have food and the drugs and infrastructure for the people. On the contrary, now Bashar al-Assad 
is pushing the people who are living in his area to go outside. And now I am in Syria, in the near the border between us and the Assad regime uh, held areas. We have a lot of people waiting in the border, in the border to pass to the liberated areas because their suffering in these these areas in that areas is huge. What, what, so why the regime do that, President? Why, why the regime forced the people uh, to uh, yes. de deploy the area? Assad, Assad regime said from the beginning that I have taken Syria with 7 million and I am ready to return this back and I will not accept to give power or to give up. And he said many times that I need homogeneous Syria. Homogeneous in his, in his mentality means I, I only need the loyalists. I don't want anybody who demonstrated or called for his democracy or freedom or for his uh, ma'ash or for his... So if, if I don't understand wrongly, you uh, mean that uh, Assad tried to create a country for uh, his government or uh, for his government? He, or for his sect? Yeah, for his sect. Yes, that's great. Yeah, for, for, for the people who accept Bashar al-Assad in power. This is in partial, yeah, partial vision. In the second part of the, of the picture, we have Iran. Iran, I'm sorry to say that, Iran has its own project in the area. We can see what happened in Iraq. So Iran now is pushing the majority of the Syrian people. And you know, who is the majority of the Syrian people to go outside and to prevent them to come back to, to Syria because Iran want to form a vacuum inside Syria and then to fill this vacuum with, with Afghanistan, Afghanistan uh, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from Iraqi militias and they are giving them now citizenship. And yeah. Are yeah. The probability of, of the refugees and ITBs to prevent them from coming back to, to their homes in the future. This is the Iranian project. We as Syrians, we know this project, Professor, not only from the revolution. The Iranian activity began in Syria from about 30, 40 years. And there were organizations. Not in only Syria. Syria, but also in Iraq and yes. other, uh, yes. other countries. in. Sometimes when we speak that, yeah. I, I feel that they don't believe us because they don't want to speak in the religious issue. But this is the truth. Iran is trying to convey all the people in this area to Shia, not only in Syria. You can see their behavior in Nigeria, even in, in, in Algeria and in Tunisia and in, in all states, in a lot of states. This is their mentality. This is their constitution to export the principles of the Iranian revolution to the world. Okay, I think this is the core of the subject and I think uh, my final question will be a follow-up for that. As you said, the Iranians, mostly Shias are now, not only the military personnel actually, I saw some photos and footage videos that are carrying some I don't want to be sectarian and use the uh, sex such as uh, Sunni, but she, but we have to be honest. They are carrying um, some Shias from Afghanistan, Iran, and Iraq, and etc. to, uh, for instance, Hama, Homs, Aleppo. Now we see that. So uh, they are changing the demography. Yeah. But uh, I think there is a hypocrisy because in Geneva and in Astana, all of them are saying that they are just like Turkey. They believe that there has to be a united uh, Syria, but it doesn't look like so. So as you said here, uh, I understand Assad wants its minor, I love it, government, even if he can't control the whole Syria with the help of the YPG. 
maybe he has uh, one option or Russia has another option, uh, an autonomous government with um, the help of EPIG's police service and arms and etc. But if he can't do it, he needs an Alevit government, Alevit state. So uh, I want to ask you, who is honest and who is now controlling Syria and who will control in the future? And now I don't want to be pessimistic, but it looks like the Syrian people are not controlling. But I want to underline that. Although the people of Syria do not control, I know that you are free now. You are, or at least your people, your child, your children, your daughters and sons are free from your chains, from these chains. Uh, but what about the control of Syria? Who will control it? Yeah, as you mentioned, we believe in the unity of Syria and it is a red line for us. And we didn't participate in the revolution uh, to divide our, our country. We, uh, we uh, got outside our homes, demonstrated protests for our dignity, for our uh, democracy. Uh, as doctor, I participated in the demonstration after I have seen the Syrian regime police forces fire people, innocent people, and they killed thousands of, of them. But now, if we look to the current situation in Syria, we can see de facto division. We have three regions. The first, theoretically, is controlled by the Assad regime, but the real power is for Russia and Iran. Assad regime will not be able to do anything without their orders. And I think you have seen the picture of Bashar al-Assad in Hmaimim military base. When yeah, yeah. has pushed him aside and uh, because he didn't want him to uh, to show up with uh, with with, uh, with Putin at, in this yeah. and the second region uh, is uh, the north uh, some of the northeast because we and Turkey are also present in the northeast of Syria in Tel Abyad and Ras Al Ain. So in parts in the first part of the northeast of Syria, we have this SDF, PYD, YBG, PKK, uh, uh, supported by the United States, and in this regard. The eyes of the Assad regime uh, and its backers and the eyes of the Syrian opposition and Turkey are directed to the northeast of Syria. All of us are trying to take this part, yani, uh, every, every side to his direction. So Russia is trying to open negotiation between SDF and Al-Assad regime and is trying to reconciliate their relationship with, with each other and to take over all of this area. At the same time, uh, Turkey and the opposition also are trying to solve the problem of PYD, PKK in this region and get rid of this terror terrorist organization and to have the, this area combined with the liberated areas. The third region is the Northwest. Mm -hmm. North, I think it is a region uh, yani, uh, looking for peace and democracy. How? Because we have the Syrian interim government, we are trying to establish institution and then to strengthen our institution to have a good governance in this area, which is very important area. Why? Because first we are responsible of our people in this area. It is our duty to provide them stability, security, food, drug, water, electricity, etc. Uh, second, to continue struggling against Bashar al-Assad until the moment of the political solution. I think that the political solution will not be close. So we have to prepare ourselves for a long struggle against the al-Assad regime. Third, I think also we and Turkey are in a huge need to show the democratic pattern which we are fighting for. So we have to uh, unify the military institution to activate our institutions to uh, uh, prepare the safe environment to allow refugees to come back to this area by the way uh, the number of refugees who have come back in the 
يعني last two years maybe more than six hundred thousand in this area. So this, okay. this is the the anatomy of this area now. All of these areas are suffering, but I think that the situation in the liberated areas, uh, even it is not good, but it is better than the the situation in the regime uh, held areas. All of in the inhabitants of these three regions are waiting the international agreements uh, regarding the Syrian file to reach a real political solution. Without that, we are afraid that the current situation will continue for a long time. Okay, uh, Professor Kareja, uh, with regards to your, I know your military background, uh, both you and President uh, can uh, answer my question, hypothetical question, I will uh, appreciate. So, as the president say that uh, there are three uh, parts in Syria now, three different parts. And uh, in the third part, he talked about, I don't want to use this uh, Turkish controlled or last opposition held uh, kind of stereotype words because I think these regions are uh, belong to serious free people now. So now these places are serious free, free people's held areas. So this is a hypothetical question. If uh, there will be no violation of ceasefire by Assad. And if uh, there will not be a political solution with regards to constitution or transfer of power and etc. in the long term, can we see, um, uh, you know, Pan uh, between South Korea or North and North Korea? A separated and Syria. Yes, yes. Uh, there is no deal, but a decades long demilitarized zone between South Korea and North Korea. There is no peace deal. There is no hostility, uh, uh, but there is just a ceasefire. It so is not can our we respect, see you know that. It is Sorry? not our respect, you know that. Yes, yes, yes. But I want to ask, is there an option? This kind of a status quo can be seen in Syria in the midterm, at least. Maybe, I think it is my idea, but it is uh, maybe Mr. President give a different uh, answer to this question, maybe, but uh, we also think what you said, uh, Mr. Orch. Yeah, we, we want the whole Syria, we want. Yeah. U.S. also mentions like that, Russia mentions like that, Iran mentions like that, but they don't want the whole Syria. It's my opinion. Mm -hmm. so, so we need uh, different uh, strategies for Turkey. B plan, C plan, D plan for the future of the Syria. Uh, because maybe the a federation, maybe a federation, maybe a confederation, uh, the, the different system. But for me, in the future, we will uh, probably uh, not face with the whole Syrian uh, country. It's, yeah. it's, it's my idea. It's my idea. I so see. maybe we, we need to, uh, or we will create uh, some different uh, policies uh, for uh, the uh, federative uh, Syria or confederative Syria, maybe separated Syria, which we never, never and never uh, uh, wants. Uh, so it's so important. For Turkey, I think after Iraq experience, yes, Turkey yeah, will maybe, definitely I, I mentioned this, before, yes. you know, that uh, 30 years, the beginning yeah. of the Iraq problem, you know, the first mm -hmm. war, second war. How can you define the Iraq government? The powerful? It is not possible. No, who is, control who is controlling Baghdad now? Yeah. So, so like... 
Another another example. It is so clear example. Afghanistan, twenty yeah. years, Mr. Orch. Twenty, Mr. Orch is twenty years. At the beginning of the uh, Afghanistan crisis, seventy six percent of the country uh, governed by uh, Taliban regime. Yeah. Twenty years left. Now seventy four. Percent of the Afghanistan now governed by uh, Taliban again. What changed then? I ask all after my after all friends. the all the international all intervention. Yeah, yeah. Million people died. The babies, the children, uh, the women, many, many, many old people. They are not guilty. They 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 killed by the uh, U.S. forces, British forces, some of them Taliban forces, but nothing changed. I I, I really worried about Syria. Why? Because we have border with Syria, nine hundred kilometers with Iraq also. Uh, Professor Kerja, this is very important. Actually, Afghanistan. I would like to make a program with you about Afghanistan, not only uh, the Afghan war of the Americans, but also Russia's role in the grave of these imperials, which is you know Ms. Afghanistan. Because you know now, now, this is now, very important, yeah, and maybe, Russia's role is Red Army's role is really important. Not, not I think. only not only Russia, not only Russia, but India and Chinese rules is so important than the Russian rules. You know. That. Yes, you're right. Okay, <laughs> Mr. President, I want to ask you another question. This was hypothetical about these three parts or divided Syria. None of us want that. And we want to see a united, peaceful and integrated and stable Syria. But there is one issue. Uh, there were some kind of new laws that adopted by President Assad in, Assad in the meantime. While he is dragging, he was dragging his foot in the in Geneva or Assad and etc. Like a property law, he said that I can the government, uh, Assad government can take uh, people's um, assets if they are not around, like homes. What about your home now in Dera? Uh, is it still safe? I'm not talking about destruction and etc. I know many places are destroyed. But are you sure of that anyone else now uh, holds your home, your house, your holdings, your car, anything, farms and etc. Because I think it was in 2018, there was no property law. And other than that, he is now, Basad as uh, Assad is now is cash stripped. He is always he is almost broke, and he is putting new fines and taxes and all the time. He says that who didn't do their military um, activity, military duty? Okay, then you should uh, give me money, or if you don't give me uh, your taxes, I will take your assets and etc. So there is a change of assets handling other than the change of demography. So I'm asking this because there are lots of polls in Turkey. People are, Turkish people are asking, since there are lots of Syrian um, uh, brothers and sisters are living with us, uh, people are asking, they want, Syrians want thinking about going back because they, they it will, it's their home. But now in time, they are losing their home or they are getting used to live in Turkey or they are now living the life in Turkey. So they don't want to go back. This is a question. But also, do you have a home to go back? Yes, thank you for this question. Now, if, can, if you can uh, review the international crisis, we can see clearly that the super majority 
of the refugees in the end uh, don't come back to their home for many reasons. You have mentioned some of the of these reasons, especially the new generation. For example, I am in, in my family. I have six children. Uh, all of them have learned in the Turkish school, and now I am trying to support their Arab language because I don't want them to to forget their their home language. Uh, and now they are ready to go to the university. So some of them doesn't know Syria. And this is very hard for them even to, to uh, explain uh, what's going in Syria for them because some of them, especially the, the, young, uh, the, people, the young guys of them don't know, know Syria. So uh, we are trying to get them visiting Syria, uh, following up the uh, news, etc. So now, for the Assad regime, Assad regime from the beginning, uh, try to find any excuse to take the properties of the Syrians who have been IDBs or refugees, especially the opponent guys. So he taken the, the homes, the cars, even their money in the banks, and he has supported himself with the law, because these guys are terrorist groups or they are dealing with foreign states. So depending on Al-Assad regime uh, mentality or behavior or even laws, it is legitimate to take their properties and to uh, uh, put them under the control of the, of the regime. It is fair. Second, uh, supporting the democratic gains, Iran tried a lot uh, uh, to use its tools to, يعني, uh, to uh, strengthen the policy of the democratic change. For that reason, they have taken citizenship. They have used the officers in the state's management units to play in a way that can they co uh, convey the tabu or the the probability from one person to another person. So yes, yes you are right. Now the majority and, or uh, uh, an important part of the Syrians are, uh, uh, or they don't have their homes uh, uh, still there inside Syria. So in the future, when they will think to come back to Syria, they will ask themselves and they will ask us, what is the future of our homes? and cars and money and, and etc. We have attended a lot in the liberated area to organize this issue, to keep the properties of the refugees and IDBs and to give them documents that can be used in the future if a political solution happens. But to speak frankly, if Bashar al-Assad uh, uh, will still in power without political solution, all of these documents will be useless. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we can change all this back. Okay, uh, this was a very, very good uh, talk, actually, not only an interview. Um, we have already overrun our time. Uh, Professor Karaja, uh, you have anything else to add? And also the president yourself, uh, President Hariri, if you have anything else to add, please, uh, last sentences. Professor. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think all we want is a free and independent Syria, uh, Mr. Oruç. Yeah, I only say that I hope in the future uh, we together uh, drink a cup, a cup of coffee in Damascus. Okay, thank you very much. Inshallah, yeah. inshallah. Uh, the president? Uh, thank you, Professor Karaja. Thank you, uh, colleague Oruj. Uh, I think we are preparing for another meeting for journalists in the beginning of July. So we have the honor to host, to welcome all of you in this uh, in this uh, meeting. By the way, uh, uh, Professor Karaja, our headquarter is very close to Aydin University. Yes, so you are yes. Welcome anytime. You are welcome to come. We, uh, we have a chance to drink a cup of tea, uh, tea yes, and coffee yes. at our university. I know that. Yes, 
Uh, in the end, I think, uh, although we are living in a very difficult situation, and uh, Professor uh, Karaja is right when we look at Iraq, Afghanistan, even, um, even now Libya and Yemen, more than 11 years in this, يعني, in this problem. Yes, although these difficult uh, circumstances, but we as Syrians, we believe that we will get our demands in the end. And uh, by the way, we have uh, uh, succeeded in our battle against the regime itself. But now we are fighting against Iran, against Russia. For that reason, I have said that the Syrian file is a regional file and international file because it is not limited now in the Syrian in the Syrian issue. It is it is bigger than that. So one day we will have our dignity, we will have our freedom, and we will remember this day. By the way, it is not it is not the 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 only uh, or it is not the the first situation we live as Syrians like that. We have a past history in the uh, occupation passed over Syria and we finished it. So uh, one day we will celebrate together with the freedom of Syria. And now um, in Izaz, at least in this area, we are living in a freedom and in a dignity and we are trying to build our democracy in this area, then to distribute it to all over of our country. Let's have another meeting in Azaz, inshallah. By the ah, way, so, yeah, you see, please, Professor, while please. our webinar was ongoing 15 minutes ago, I just delivered three of your very, very uh, crucial and very, very valuable books. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, I, am, I am so excited to start to read them soon. And please accept and my regards to President uh, Mustafa Aydin and I thank you and Istanbul University on behalf of you to give us this opportunity and Mr. Hari, thank you for uh, answering all of our questions. Uh, uh, the, the, you were really open and you were really kind and you answered I think all of our questions. I hope uh, as uh, Professor Karaja said, uh, uh, soon we can drink uh, coffee. coffee. I prefer coffee, by the way, not not tea. <laughs> uh, in the Moscow's, inshallah, oh, in yeah. in a free Syria. Inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I also agree with uh, Miss Orich that it is a very very useful webinar. Uh, it is very important, really. Uh, to receive direct information from a leader involved uh, in the problems. Uh, I, I uh, hope and mention again, uh, really we want uh, a free and independent Syria uh, and uh, hope to drink coffee tea. It is oh. not important <laughs> to gather in Damascus in the near future. Uh, on behalf of my university and institute, really I salute both of you. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Ms. President and Ms. Orich. Hope uh, together with another webinar or, or uh, maybe after the pandemic, we will organize face-to-face -face organization. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fiamanila. Have a good day. Bye.